Look at the result of fire, the shocking destruction of a valuable resource. Had it been detected and reported when small and attacked on the spot, this waste and destruction could have been avoided. The worst enemy of the forest is fire. Fire caused by lightning, smokers, campers, by railroads and industrial operations. The forest is British Columbia's major resource, and the province's great stands of timber are under the watch and care of the lookout man. The lookout is small. The bigger a forest fire grows, the harder it is to fight. The smaller a fire, when the suppression crew gets to it, the greater their chance to gain control. Catch the fire small and hit it hard. The efficiency of the whole firefighting organization depends on the speed and accuracy with which fires are discovered, reported, and attacked. The lookout man forms the major part of the fire detection system. He holds a most important and responsible position. The Forest Service has located some 155 primary lookouts and there's much thought and careful planning before a lookout is built on a selected position. In addition to the first line lookouts, there are also secondary lookouts for temporary use when the fire hazard is high. 10 miles is considered the maximum distance for good observation. This would place a primary station at every 20 miles and is quite out of the question because of the considerable number and their cost. This limits the number of primary lookouts to those whose costs are justified by the value of the timber protected, the degree of hazard, and the risk of destruction. Country blind to one lookout may be seen and covered from another. The exact position of the fire is plotted by taking and reporting cross shots from two lookouts. The cross shot method, particularly over long distances, is a simple and most useful means of locating fires. Without communication to Ranger headquarters, the work of the lookout man would be impossible. By radio, by phone, or a combination of both, he must maintain communication, or the detection system will fail. In the Ranger organization, the lookout man holds a key position, and his reports are made directly to the Forest Ranger staff. The staff at the ranger station is organized and ready to act immediately upon the report from the lookout man. The lookout man must be alert and vigilant. His duty is to report early and accurately, for by his report he can direct the firefighters to a fire quickly and prevent lost time and wasted travel. When the fire is blowing up, everybody's reporting it. This is too late. The lookout man must know his job. He must have the proper tools and know how to use them. The firefinder. Photos. Records. Log. Radio. Binoculars. Colored glasses and his eyesight must be good. The Forest Service Firefinder is precise. The instrument is well made and gives accurate readings on fire locations. In using it, there are four points to remember. One, the Firefinder is oriented with due north. Two, the bearing ring of full circle is marked in degrees from 0 to 360. Three, the sight moves a measured number of degrees from north when sighting on a smoke. Four, the bearing red at the belt buckle is the number of degrees of the fire from north. To get a direct reading quickly, zero degrees on the bearing ring is positioned due south instead of the usual north. When the sight swings, the correct bearing lies directly under the peep sight marker. 
the firefinder is designed to meet the needs of the lookout man. Each part has its own particular use. One, the lower plate and azimuth ring bolts the finder to its stand. Two, the map plate fits over the lower plate and the set screw locks the map, zeroed north and south, to the azimuth ring. Three, the upper plate carries the sighting gear. Both rotate freely on the base. The pointer under the peep sight indicates the bearing sighted. Four, the sighting gear has a crosshair foresight, a rear peep sight, and a pointer. A spirit level on the arm levels the sight with the horizon. Five, the vertical angle scale measures the distance of a fire above or below the horizon. Six, the knurled nut raises and lowers the sighting arm. Seven, the sighting gear moves six or seven inches to either side to avoid posts or frames of the lookout. Eight, a lining tape runs directly under the arm. It reaches just clear of the map. The firefinder, when set up, must be dead level. Its crate is built as a stand for the instrument. To mount the firefinder, the stand must be leveled and secured to the floor. With the firefinder correctly assembled, Check that the map plate is locked with the north point of the map exactly at 180 degrees on the azimuth ring. Check it with a red line drawn north and south on the map through the position of the lookout. Swing the sighting gear pointer to zero. The top of the red line should point to 180 degrees and the lining tape should be in line with the red line on the map. When this is done, the firefinder is ready to be oriented with true north and fixed to the stand. With all parts properly in line, the firefinder must be fixed to its stand so that both the map and the bearing ring always point due north. This is done in five easy steps. One, center the finder on the stand with the sighting gear aimed approximately north. Two, from a lookout photo, Take the bearing of a surveyed reference point. Swing the sighting gear to the bearing of the point selected. Three, without touching the sighting gear, gently move the complete firefinder until the reference point is accurately in the sights. Four, when the instrument is in position, carefully fix it to the top of the stand with two of the screws. Five, select a second reference point from the photos, one in another quadrant, and swinging the sighting gear only, lay the crosshairs on this point. Read the bearing and compare it with the bearing of that point on the photo. If the bearings agree, put the other two screws in place. The firefinder is oriented. If the bearings do not agree, then probably the firefinder is not level. Level it and repeat the same five steps. The next step is to see that the bubble on the sighting arm is level with the horizon and the vertical marker is at zero. To do this, select a point on the lookout photo where the zero line of the vertical scale touches the skyline. Next, accurately lay the horizontal crosshair on this point. The bubble should be level. If not, the spirit level must be raised or lowered at one end to level the bubble in agreement with the zero line on the photo. Now, see that the vertical angle marker is at zero. Bubble and vertical scale are now in correct agreement with the horizon. The first thing a man new to a lookout must do is learn the country. In a strange area, it's difficult for a man to locate accurately any given point, yet this he must do. The simplest and quickest way for the new lookout man to know the country is for him to locate, name, and record all prominent landmarks readily identified on maps and photos. These are reference points for him to use when reporting smokes. 
There are three ways to learn the country. One, study the map and the country together, and then sight on particular points with the firefinder. Note the bearing from north. Measure the distance on the map. Two, note with the ranger or the assistant ranger all well-known landmarks. Then check their location by map, firefinder, and photos. Three, identify lakes, mountaintops, woods, clearings, mill sites, all features on the lookout photos. Note the grid location on the photo. Tie it in to the map location. When a landmark has been proved, the details of its location must be recorded in a log. The log can be in list form or a simple sketch with concentric circles to mark distances. A log makes a handy and quick reference, and there's no use measuring landmarks unless they're logged. Lookout photos are taken in a set with a precise surveying camera. Each photo faithfully reproduces a section of the landscape exactly as seen from the lookout. The photos are covered with grid direction lines measured in degrees and minutes, corresponding exactly with the bearing lines on the azimuth ring of the firefinder. When the lookout man sights on a smoke, he locates the bearing line on the photo of that quadrant. In his hand is a picture giving the direction of the fire from the lookout. The grid lines on the photos show a horizontal line marked to zero, which is exactly the same height as the lookout. The lines above and below are marked in degrees and minutes. When sighting downhill at a fire, which is usual, the lookout man reads the degrees and minutes of the down slope on his firefinder. This reading applied to the photo grid shows him the location of the fire on the photo. The position of the fire is now fixed. He passes this information by radio or phone to the ranger. By reference to duplicate photos, the ranger sees immediately where the fire is burning. The ranger and lookout man together should check the radio, batteries, and aerial so the lookout man understands them and, if there's trouble, can make adjustments when instructed. With no communication, a lookout is out of action. Its equipment includes either, or in combination, a telephone, a Model B radio, and an FM portable radio, all to be treated with care and respect. A handbook explains the equipment and its use. It must be studied. It's against the law to transmit an unidentified signal. The call must be given at the beginning of every transmission, after each five-minute period during a conversation and when signing off. The station being called is mentioned first, and to make his call, the lookout man gives the following. First, the call sign of the station called. Then the words, this is, followed by the call sign of the lookout. To get a reply to his call, he used over or go ahead. When the call is answered and complete, each station gives his call sign followed by clear or out. We can now follow our lookout man in action on sighting a smoke. He must operate the fire finder, locate the position of the fire, and report it to the dispatcher at the ranger's office. He swings the sighting gear until almost in line with the fire. He levels the bubble on the arm and checks that the vertical scale pointer is at zero. He sights the crosshairs at the base of the smoke, which lines the sighting gear with the fire. He reads the bearing on the azimuth ring and notes it. He plots the position on the lookout photo. He locates the same point on the map and with a ruler measures the distance. He then radios the information to the ranger station. 
XLZ-86, Lake Carchin, this is XMQ-49, log lookout. XLZ-86 back, go ahead. I have a smoke for you, bearing 270 degrees, uh, 30 minutes, uh, vertical angle, uh, minus 2 degrees, uh, distance 6 miles, on the Henderson property. Over. Bearing 270 degrees, 30 minutes, vertical angle, minus 2 degrees, distance 6 miles. Confirm and over. Roger, roger. It's beginning to send up black smoke. I'm not moving yet, but it looks as though it might. Topography is steep. And old logging, over. How big is it, over? Uh, only a spot, over. We have checked with a report from Bald Lookout and confirmed that your fire is on the Henderson property. Sandy is on his way. Keep an eye on it, over. XMQ49 standing by. <coughs> XLZ-86 clear with XMQ-49 and calling XM-088. Over. The detailed necessary information given by the lookout man to the ranger office was by headings, bearing 270 degrees, 30 minutes. Vertical angle, minus 2 degrees. Distance, 6 miles. Descriptive location, Henderson property. Approximate size, spot. Smoke color, black. Movement, not yet, but might. Topography, steep. Fuel, logging slash. In addition to the location and the description of the fire, the lookout man from his vantage point should be able to give other helpful details, such as access and nearness to water. Before a lookout man can be skillful and efficient, he must learn to observe. The technique calls for the use of binoculars, colored glasses, and knowing how visibility is affected by atmospheric haze, industrial smoke, and forest fire smoke, the background, and the position of the sun. When smoke and haze reduce visibility, the lookout man must increase his use of colored glasses. He must take advantage of any shift or momentary clearing of haze to scan the country when it's clear. The lookout man will see smoke easier and quicker when looking toward the sun than when the sun is at his back. With the smoke between him and the sun, the rays make the smoke brighter and easier to see. However, it's still necessary to scan high-risk areas with the sun at various positions. Light-colored smokes show best against a dark background, and vice versa. The lookout man must study his country, know its colors and backgrounds. He must be able to describe smoke by its size, shape, color, movement, and direction. Essentially, he must distinguish smoke from clouds, fog patches, dust, gray rock bluffs, and from light-colored old burns. By study, he learns the characteristics of smoke, and soon can tell quickly and accurately when a forest fire starts. His system is this. Know the country. Know the background. Know where industrial smoke rises. Recognize what looks like smoke but is not, and then Always be alert for any change. Really, what a lookout man watches for day after day is not just smoke, but movement and change in a familiar landscape. The change from the familiar will catch the eye, and careful scanning will pick up strange smoke. Getting supplies to a lookout usually requires special arrangements. These must be practical and made with the ranger staff before manning the lookout. An initial month's supply of staples should be maintained and supplemented every week or two with fresh food. Living and working space is limited. To be efficient, the lookout must be neat and tidy, and after checking, supplies should be carefully stored. Along with the equipment, bedding, and cooking utensils are provided, and all have a proper place. Proper food is important. A cookbook often helps a man get away from too much use of a frying pan. A portable radio is a pleasant touch with the outside. Beside the first aid kit, which is always handy, another safety feature built into the lookout 
is the lightning arrestor system. By checking that the arrestor system is properly grounded, the lookout man will be sure that during a storm when lightning strikes, his safest place is right inside the lookout. The stovepipe should be clear of the lightning arrestor and the stove itself should be grounded. During a storm, take common sense precautions and one, keep clear of metal objects. Two, don't phone or radio with the storm overhead. Three, ground all wires with the ground switch. The lookout man's regular radio schedule with the ranger station is another safety feature, but along with the schedule, he can make an emergency call when he has to. Any failure to keep routine schedules will bring help. If he is to be away from the lookout for any period of time, he must inform the ranger staff, and any extended absence requires permission. It's always possible for him to get fog-bound or lost. Loneliness can be a problem, living in solitude for almost half the year. The answer lies partly in a hobby, like this interest in a tiny garden. Besides taking care of the appearance of a lookout and himself, it's also wise to take reasonable exercise. A regular walk and a good stack of firewood helps keep a man healthy and fit. Someone always seems to know when the kettle's on and there's a brew of tea going. Well, why not? Anyone who's come this far to enjoy the view also appreciates a cup of a lookout man's brew. <laughs> 